Hi, my name is Angelica Borja. This is my midterm project on the synthesis of triphenylene via the palladium catalyzed annihilation of benzene. The original experiment was by Katie A. Spence, Mela Uni M. Mehta, and Neil K. Garg. This is the overall reaction. Two bromobiphenyl and two trimethylsilophenyl trifluoromethane sulfate are catalyzed by palladium to form triphenylene. CCM fluoride, acetonitrile, and toluene are also used as reagents in this reaction. The product of the experiment was a substance called triphenylene. Triphenylene is a symmetrical aromatic hydrocarbon. This gives the molecule thermal stability, chemical stability, conjugation, planarity, and rigidity. As such, it is an attractive substance for use in DLCs and supermolecular chemistry. A different ways of synthesizing triphenylene have been done before. The majority of these approaches featured harsh reaction conditions or limited opportunities for derivatization. For example, one method used arenes. However, the arenes would trimerize, preventing the synthesis of triphenylene derivatives. Other methods use pyrophoric agents, sublimation, and the gut box. Pyrophoric agents are substances that ignite when they react with oxygen. Thus, the use of the glove box is necessary to prevent the whole experiment from going up in flames. The procedure in the paper is described as quick and facile, as well as using only mild generation methods, and that it can, it can be used to synthesize a variety of triphenylene derivatives. The paper supports this claim as no mention of a glove box or similar safety measure is mentioned in the procedure of the experiment. All materials purchased for the experiment were used as needed. A particular note is palladium, as palladium is an expensive metal. Only a small amount of palladium was used and, because it was used as a catalyst, the palladium can also be used again, thus further reducing costs. The scale of the experiment, presumably, is limited by the use of the packed column. In the previous experiment we did in our lab, the textbook stated that using a column to separate more than 10 grams of material is expensive and time consuming. The checking process was done by Dana Batterjee and Kathleen Cruden. All the photos available in the report were provided by the checkers. No other comments came from the checkers. Reaction apparatus. The reaction flask was a 500 milliliter round button flask, single neck with a 24 lead joint. They were oven dried and they would later be fitted with a to a condenser using a clamp, a 2440 keck clip. This is the reflux condenser. It has a 3.5 centimeter outer diameter and is 35 centimeters tall. It has a 2440 joint, which connects to the 500 milliliter round bottom flask. And the top end is attached to a slank line using a slank adapter. A 1000 milliliter separator funnel a rotary evaporator, which removes the solvents through, from samples through evaporation, a packed column, which is five centimeters out of diameter and 17 centimeters tall, containing 250 grams of silica gel. Now, the reagents and starting materials, as well as their safety and hazards. We have this dibenzyl dn actone palladium, which is our catalyst, with triotyl phosphine, two bromobiphenyl, and two trimethylcellophenyl trifluoromethane sulfonate, dry toluene, dry acetonitrile, cesium fluoride, saturated sodium chloride solution, ether, and hydrosodium sulfate, silica gel, 1,9 ethyl acetate hexanes methylene chloride, pentane, and argon. Two bromobiphenyl was the limiting reagent according to the paper. This is we know this because two bromobiphenyl had one equivalence, while two trimethylsilophenyl trifluoromethane sulfonate had 1.2 equivalents. Argon is frequently used to dry both the flasks and to place the flask under pressure. This is because argon is a noble gas. Its non-reactive nature means that it will not reactivate the chemicals in the experiment and will instead create an inert atmosphere. 
The toluene and acetonitrile needed to be used needed to be used under an atmosphere of argon. All other materials were purchased and used as received. Step one: an oven dried single neck 500 milliliter round bottom flask containing an over dried Teflon coated magnetic stir bar is fitted with a 2040 rubber septum that is pierced with a needle attached to a stunt line. See figure eight for that. The fast is then dried by vacuum heat argon cycle prior to use. The fast is then opened to the air and charged with the palladium and the triotolyl phosphine, each in one portion. Two bromo biphenyl and two trimethylsilophenyl trifluoromethane sulfonate are then added consecutively each over 30 seconds via syringe using needles. The rubber septum with an argon innate is restored. And the fast is then placed under positive pressure of argon. Dry colloene and dry acetonitrile are added sequentially to the flask, each over one minute by syringe using the needles to give a suspension. Cesium fluoride is added quickly in one portion. The rubber septum with an argon inlet is restored again, and the reaction mixture is allowed to stir for 23 degrees at, for 15 minutes at 400 rounds per minute. During this time, an oven-dried reflex condenser, 3.5, Outer diameter, 35, millimeters, 35 centimeters tall, 2440 joint, is capped on the bottom with a round bottom flask, and the top end is attached to a snack line using a snack adapter, allowed to cool to 30, 23 degrees Celsius under vacuum. The apparatus is then dried by vacuum heat argon cycle prior to use. After 50 minutes, the reaction flask is fitted with the condenser. The joint between the condenser and the round band flask is greased and clamped with a 2040 keck clip. The top of the condenser is attached to the slunk line. The apparatus eva is evacuated and backfilled with argon, at which time cold water is flowing through the condenser. The flask is then placed in the oil bath preheated to 110 Celsius and allowed to stir at 400 rounds per minute for 24 hours while under positive pressure of argon. After 24 hours, the flask is removed from the oil bath and allowed to cool to 23 degrees Celsius over 30 minutes while stirring. Here is the reaction setup. And here is the reaction mixture in the oil bath. As you can see, after 30 minutes, the solution is uh, brown. The flask is then opened in the air and the stir bar is carefully removed. The contents of the flask are then transferred into a 1,000 meters milliliter separatory funnel. Here is the figure A is the separatory funnel right after the mixture is added. The figure in the middle, figure B, is how it looks after the first extraction. And figure C, the one on the right, is how it looks after a second extraction. Saturated sodium chloride and ether are then added to the flask and transferred to a 1000 milliliter separatory funnel, which is what we saw in the previous slide. The funnel is shaken and the layers are separated. The aqueous layer is then extracted with ether. The organic layers are combined, dried over anhydrous sodium sulfide, then gravity filtered into a 500 milliliter round bottom flask. The filtrate is concentrated on the rotary evaporator to afford the late bond solid. The rotary evaporator is the, what we see on the left. And after the rotary evaporator evaporates the solvent, we see this light brown mixture. The 500 milliliter round bond of fast with the crude project product is charged with silica gel. The crude materials and silica gel are suspended in methylene chloride and concentrated under reduced pressure. The product absorbed silica is then dried on high vacuum for 50 minutes until fine and powdery. The product absorbed silica is charged on a column of 250 grams of silica gel. The column is eluded with 1,9 ethyl acetate hexanes, 25, uh, sorry, 25 two and a half liters 
and collected into 10 milliliter culture tubes. Desired product should elute as a light yellow solution. On the left, we see the column with the silicone gel stationary phase. Here is the combined fractions after column chromatography. See it's how it's yellow. These fractions are pulled and concentrated under reduced pressure in the 500 milliliter round bottom flask to form a yellow orange solid. See again what's on the left. The solid is suspended in methylene chloride in a single necked 500 milliliter round bottom flask and charged with a Teflon coated magnetic stir bar. The flask is then fitted with an air condenser open the air and the joint is attached between the air condenser and the round bottom flask. Oh, sorry, the joint between the air condenser and the round bottom flask is fitted with a green keck lamp. The apparatus is then placed in an oil bath preheated to 45 degrees Celsius and stirred for 10 minutes. After the allocated time, pentane is poured slowly down the wall of the air condenser into the solution over 5 minutes. See the picture on the left to for how it looks like after being stirred for 10 minutes, but before the pentane is added. The apparatus is then removed from the oil bath and placed in an ice bath for 30 minutes. The white, a white solid precipitates out of the yellow-orange solution. See the picture on the left again, where the white solid is precipitating out. The solution is then poured through a Buckner funnel fitted with a piece of Wattman 4 qualitative filter paper. The white crystals are collected onto the filter paper. The crystals are washed with pentane, collected into a 1,000 milliliter round bottom flask and weighed. The filtrate is then concentrated under reduced pressure to, redu to afford an orange solid, which is recrystallized. The product collected during the second recrystallization is combined with the triphenylene crystals in the 100 milliliter round bottom flask and dried under vacuum for 30 minutes to afford the white so crystalline solid. Here is the final product, the triphenylene. There are several methods of purification that occur during this process. One way is the rotary evaporator, which is used to evaporate the solvent from the sample. A second way is the column chromatography. That is the column packed with silica gel that separates the crude product into fractions based on polar ray actions, interactions. And then there's the crystallization. The crude product is placed in an ice bath until a white solid precipitates out. This is done at least twice to ensure purity of the substance. And while the, in conjunction with the crystallization, Wappen 4 qualitative filter paper is used as well. The solution is poured into a Buckner funnel fitted with the filter paper and the white precipitate is collected. For proof of purity, throughout the entire experiment, the TLC analysis is used to monitor the progress of the reaction. At the end of the experiment, both HNMR and CNMR were done on the final product to produce to, pro to prove its identity. And the notes on the paper state that an IR was used, but the PDF did not show an IR graph. Safety and warnings. This reaction is not more dangerous than any other reactions, especially when you compare it to the previous experience mentioned where the whole procedure had to occur inside a glove box. So uh, s items like this benzyl dienactone palladium are flammable and irritant. Triotolophosphine is a skin and eye irritant. 2-bromobiphenol is a skin eye and respiratory irritant. 2 trimethylsilophenyl trifluoromethane sulfonate is corrosive. Cesium fluoride is corrosive, acute toxic irritant, and the health hazard. And magnesium sulfate is an irritant. So, safe, basic safety in the lab, gloves, lab coat, goggles, do not breathe it in. There is no curved and arrow mechanism available for the procedure. Looking into the experiments that inspired this, this, this particular experiment reveals several possible mechanisms. However, these experiments ultimately utilize different materials. 
The discussion portion of the report states that an arene is formed in situ and acts as a substrate in the palladium catalyzed annihilation with a biaryl bromide. Two CC bonds are formed in a synthetic step. Either the in addition, either the biaryl halide or the silyl triflate can be functionalized before performing the annihilation in order to synthesize several triphenylene derivatives. This experiment can theoretically be done in our school lab. Many of, the many of the methods described, such as the column elution and the separatory funnel, are methods that we have already done in previous labs. What we have not done before is vacuum heat glassware to dry them and keep glass under positive pressure of argon. Nor have we used an oil bath or a rotary evaporator. However, this procedure has a step where it requires the flask to be placed under an oil bath preheated in to 110 degrees Celsius and stirred for 24 hours while under positive pressure of argon, and we do not have, to, not have the time to complete the step in a single class period, nor can we leave the step on its own over the week to continue the experiment in the next class. There, the three authors are Katie Spence, who was, at the time of the experiment, was a fifth-year graduate student in Professor Neil K. Garg's lab at the University of California, Los Angeles. She has a BA in chemistry and psychology. And in Professor Garg's lab, she develops synthetic methodologies that employ strain intermediates. Naluni Mehta, at the time of the experiment, she was also a fifth year graduate student in Professor Neil K. Garg's laboratory. She has a BA in chemistry. And for her graduate studies, she is primarily focused on developing nickel catalyzed cross coupling reactions. Neil Garg, is a professor of chemistry and the Kenneth N. Trueblood Endowed Chair at the University of California, Los Angeles. His laboratory is focused on developing novel synthetic strategies and methodologies to enable the total synthesis of complex bioactive molecules. And that is it. This is, this is my midterm project. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.